is Andy from HowEFIWorks.com and today I want to talk about choosing an ignition trigger wheel. We're going to make the assumption you're doing a clean install on a new motor and you want to choose the best trigger wheel for your combination. This is a typical motor. What we have is in the front you have the crankshaft harmonic balancer and normally what we're doing is mounting a trigger wheel of some sort on the front of the motor to let the ECU have a way to calculate where the pistons are in the four strokes of the motor. The problem is, is that if we're, all we're watching is the crankshaft, the crankshaft spins 720 degrees per engine cycle. What we can't tell by a simple gear at the front with a missing tooth is whether or not we're in on the compression stroke or the exhaust stroke. So what we do is watch the camshaft with a second sensor. We use the one at the bottom for high accuracy of the crankshaft location and the top one sitting at cam speed 360 degrees per engine cycle and we will use an on off type trigger on the camshaft somewhere so that the ECU can find what phase the motor is currently in. Here is a typical 36 minus 1 trigger wheel. Notice that there's actually 35 evenly spaced teeth and a single tooth has been ground away. So what the ECU can do is find the first tooth after the missing tooth, but the problem is that you have to add an additional cam sync sensor to get full sequential fuel and ignition. Here is a 60 minus 2 trigger wheel, also known as a 58X in the Chevrolet world. What it is is pretty much the same thing as a 36 minus 1. You've got 60 teeth, or would have been 60 teeth before two were removed, or 58 actual teeth. And again, the ECU will pick up that wide gap as a known crank location. There's also a way to do timing with no missing tooth. This would be a gear out of a Honda Nippon Denso type distributor, very common in the Japanese car industry. On the left, I'm showing a gear that I purchased that had pretty much the same width and spacing on the teeth. If you do decide to go to a larger gear with more teeth, uh, that's fine except make sure that your ECU can accommodate that number of teeth. And last, this is a four-toothed wheel, very common in the aftermarket uh, V8 world. And what you can see is the four magnets. Notice they're at 90 degrees spacing. Here's how the math works. A 60-tooth wheel at crank speed gives six crank degrees per tooth. It's pretty good accuracy. A 36 tooth wheel at crank speed is giving a tooth to the ECU at 10 crank degrees per tooth. A 24 tooth wheel running at cam speed, again very common in the Japanese distributors, is a full 30 crank degrees per tooth. And if you have a 4 tooth at crank speed, that's 90 crank degrees per tooth. Here's another couple of facts. At 10,000 RPM per second accel rates, and that's, by the way, fairly common on a throttle stab, upshift, or downshift, the motor is spinning 200 RPM faster or slower every revolution when climbing through 3,000 RPM. When running at 3 millisecond ignition dwell at 3,000 RPM, the spark has to be scheduled 54 crank degrees before the spark fires. That is a big number if you're only seeing teeth every 90 degrees. That's a lot of uncertainty for the ECU to be working with. So now, a couple of rules of thumb. The code would like to see a tooth at a very minimum of about two and a half milliseconds per tooth and no faster than about 0.15 milliseconds per tooth. The reason you don't want to bring him to the ECU any faster is that it's simply too much processing time processing all those teeth. Bottom line is a 12 tooth wheel at crank speed is really only prime from about 2000 RPM to up say 25,000 RPM. Realistically that number will never happen. 
but a 24 tooth wheel is in its prime between about 1,000 RPM and 16,000 RPM. Very common in the high revving motorcycle industry. A 36 tooth wheel is good from about 650 RPM or so up to about 11,000, which is the range that lots of our motors are spending most of its time. And a 60 tooth wheel is great down at low RPM like idle up through about 6,500, maybe 7,000 RPM. So now let's take a look at what the ECU is looking at in the code. In the bluish is the teeth at crankshaft speed. This happens to be a 36 minus two. So you'd actually count 34 teeth and two missing. What you're seeing in green is the signal coming from the camshaft. So for one revolution, the camshaft showed up. For the next revolution of 360 degrees, there was no tooth from the camshaft. With that, we have enough information to figure out what stroke the engine is on. When you're running this sort of setup, the exact location of the cam tooth is not that critical. It's just a matter of did it show up in that 360 degrees of rotation or did it not? By the way, the spacing at the bottom, you notice it's real tight, a little wider, tight again, and wider. What that is, is the engine pushing up through the compression of the motor and the location of the missing tooth can be critical. What happens is, if you don't have a wide enough space with the missing teeth, the ECU can't consistently find where that gap is. This is the distributor that has a 40 tooth evenly spaced teeth and a single cam tooth. What the ECU is doing is lining up the beginning or possibly the end of the cam tooth with the 40 teeth at the bottom. You can see that that timing starts getting really critical. This is the same plot, but just zoomed in. And you can see where the beginning of this tooth does not really line up with either of these. And it can be anywhere in this range. That would work fine. Or possibly you can come off the back edge of this tooth compared to these teeth. This all works great as long as you're on the same shaft, such as inside the distributor. But if you get into a situation where your crank teeth are down at the crankshaft, and this is up on the camshaft, sometimes chain stretch, uh, vibration, all sorts of things uh, can cause all kinds of problems for you on this timing, and you'll end up with this tooth on the other side of the crank tooth. What that will wind up doing is giving you a lost sink air every time the teeth don't line up as the ECU expected. This happens to be on the front of a Subaru, I believe. What we have is, notice, you probably would have had 36 teeth. I didn't actually count them. But what you have is missing teeth, two locations here and down here. The point is, some ECUs can deal with some of these fairly creative tooth patterns, others cannot. Make sure you plan ahead that your ECU can accommodate the toothed wheel that you've chosen. Right here is the uh, Hall or VR sensor. Remember that this has to be solidly mounted to the motor. Another thing to keep account of is this ring really should be in a solid part of the harmonic balancer and not mounted to the rubber moving part of the harmonic balancer. That might be enough to give variation in your timing. One of the things I like to do when I'm bringing one of these up from scratch is have all 36 teeth on the wheel. Go ahead and mount this sensor anywhere that works out well on your motor and then later cut out the tooth that works out about 60 degrees before the beginning of the compression stroke and I'll just arbitrarily take that tooth out. Here's what a couple of the fairly common hall sensors look like. The one on the left is by Motec. The beauty of this one is it was designed to, to pick up very small teeth at high speeds. This thread is a 3 8 thread, so it makes it fairly easy to move the sensor in and out and hide it in small spaces. One of the only two downsides is this thing does run about $200. And if you need two of them, there's $400 in sensors alone. And the wires are a little sensitive to vibration. They're fairly small, so make sure you plan ahead 
a way to mount these down solidly to somewhere on the motor so they don't vibrate. On the right is a Cherry Hall sensor, very similar to the Hall sensor on the left. Uh, it's, I believe, 13 millimeter thread, so it's a little larger. It's so oh, about two and a half inches long. Again, plan ahead on a way to protect the wires. Uh, they are fairly delicate. They're Make sure anytime you plan on using some sort of Hall or VR sensor that it is automotive environment rated. Last, this happens to be a distributor uh, that has been modified. What we did is removed the original rotor and then made a chopper wheel to sit down in there, cut a hole in the chopper wheel. This is an Excel piece known as a points eliminator, but it is an optical sensor that shoots through the hole every time it comes around. That's where we pick up the engine phase. And then in the back, you can see my 40 tooth gear that is actually working as the crankshaft position sensor. We're back to our basic motor. What is the easiest, most reliable way to do this? If I have the room on the front of the motor, I always opt for a 36 minus one. That is kind of a compromise between enough teeth to get accurate timing without too many teeth to tie up the processor too much. Also, as you get to more and more teeth, the more difficult it is for the hull sensor to pick up the individual teeth. 36 minus one is a great compromise. We like to mount a single chopper wheel of some sort back in the back to get cam phase. That would end up a simple one tooth wheel in the back. One of the things you always want to try to avoid is having even spaced wheel in the front of the motor and a single tooth in the back that you have to have that phase exactly correct when the motor has to transfer all the power through the belt through the cam, any slop you may have in this connection, and you end up with starting issues. If you happen to be trying to start a single cylinder uh, motorcycle engine, for example, especially when it's high compression, it's sometimes easiest for the ECU to work with a non-missing tooth wheel on the crankshaft. The problem is now we have to mount a cam sensor somewhere and that timing of the cam to the crank sensor is very critical. So we try to stay down in the 12 tooth range down here. So it's a little easier to hit your cam timing with respect to your crank timing. I would like to thank my friends at tunerstudio.com. These are the guys that developed Mega Log Viewer HD. I use to validate almost all tunes. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.